Well, today is uh, my last visit to the Great Commission during this series on discipleship. We've looked at a lot. We focused on Jesus' authority and how the disciples that we're making really are Jesus' disciples and not ours. <clears throat> we looked at Luke's version, which emphasized repentance and forgiveness of sins in the disciple-making process. We thought about Jesus' mission to the Gentiles, our commission to bring the gospel to everyone who is far from it. Mark's version brought an even bigger perspective than nations as making disciples as, uh, expresses God's redemption of all creation. The command to baptize revealed the institutional church as a trellis for God's people. We explored what it means to teach obedience to all Jesus commanded, exploring his magnificent summary of God's law. And along the way, we've started to share with each other a little bit about what God's doing in our lives on the website. I encourage you to keep that up. Let me read this uh, passage to you one more time. It's from Matthew chapter 28. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And we conclude looking at that last statement, that I'll be with you always, even to the very end of the age. The Great Commission in Matthew is recorded at the very end end of the book not toward the end it is the end what you see here are the last verses of Matthew is anything missing there's no mention here of the ascension all the other gospels mention it Matthew doesn't if Matthew were all that you had if it was the only gospel you had you might think that Jesus was still living and working in this world. That he was personally directing the expansion of the church and applying the gospel to every nation. We mustn't lose the impact of Matthew's editorial decision because it was quite on purpose. Matthew knew that Jesus had ascended. He was there and anyone reading his book undoubtedly knew that was part of his story. And there were three other gospels anyway that made that quite clear. But Matthew did not include it. The gospel writers arranged their material for a reason. And Matthew wanted to finish Jesus' story with the sense that he hadn't gone anywhere. That he's risen, that he's alive, and that he's still here. And the Great Commission is not just a command for us to make disciples. It is a command or an invitation to make disciples with him. How this is true really involves the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised that his spirit, the Holy Spirit, would guide us into all truth by making him known. That's how he would do it. The role of the Holy Spirit in this age is so much more than inspiring our singing or giving us spiritual gifts. Those are all means to a larger end. What the Holy Spirit is here to do is to testify of Christ, to reveal Christ to the world, to manifest Christ in the world through his church as if it were his body. Because it is through the human and divine Jesus that we are reconciled to God. Jesus, the God-man, ascended bodily into heaven. But the Holy Spirit manifests his presence on earth, not as a memory, but as a living person among those who have the faith to see him. Jesus says he knocks at the door of every congregation. And if we open the door, he says he'll come in and personally fellowship with us. He fellowships with us individually, and when two or more together, he says, I'm right there with you in your midst. Now our awareness of Christ, that's going to ebb and flow with our faith. Our ability to sense him is going to track with our time in scripture, prayer, sacraments, fellowship, all the things we call means of grace. It tracks with our maturity to seek him during very challenging circumstances. But Jesus is in fact with us, whether we sense him or not. Why is Jesus here? Why did he return through the Holy Spirit? He's going to return bodily one day to judge this planet. Why did he come back before then through the Holy Spirit? 
to build his church. Who does Christ say will build his church? Peter? The apostles? Us? Well, now, it's true. He builds his church on the foundation of God's sovereign work in us, on the, on the, on the sovereign work that gives us faith in him that the Father inspires in us. But who builds the church of Jesus Christ? He does. That's why he's here. The work of Jesus Christ, personally, building his church through the work of the Holy Spirit, that is what defines the age in which we live. It is an age, he says, I'm going to be with you to the end of the age. What age? The age that officially began at Pentecost. It's going to end when Christ returns bodily from heaven to remake the planet. But until that final day, this age is about Jesus populating a, the paradise he's planning to remake. And he's doing it personally. What did you think it meant for Jesus to be with us always? I'm amazed at how many think of Jesus being with us as something passive as if he were twiddling his thumbs in the corner waiting for us to need him. If Jesus is here, the implications for disciple making are enormous. One thing it means is kind of surprising. It means that making disciples is not a commission. Or at least it's more than a commission. You know, we call these verses the Great Commission, right? Uh, Jesus didn't give it that title. It's not called that in the Bible. Hudson Taylor made it popular, but the, far, the furthest back I can find it was uh, a mention from a Dutch missionary in the 17th century. It's not biblical, and if we aren't careful, it can come a little bit misleading. A commission tells somebody to go out and do something on behalf of somebody else. So if we use the word commission we're saying that Jesus assigned us a task to go out and accomplish for him. And then one day he'll return and he'll see how we've done. Now, since Christ is physically absent, there's some truth in that. But if Jesus is with us through the Holy Spirit as we do this, then it is more than a commission. It's more like a partnership, a task that we are called to accomplish, not just for him, but with him with him that's important when i was 10 years old we moved from eastport to the banks of weems creek in annapolis and one of our first projects was to turn the mud pit outside of our daylight basement into a patio and that patio was designed to have like 50 big square blocks of concrete each block i require i, I remember so distinctly required you take this wheelbarrow, one of those wheelbarrows that had gotten covered with concrete, very heavy. Take this wheelbarrow and push it up the hill to the big mound of gravel we had dumped and to pile it full of gravel, bring it back down the hill when it was all full, throw it into the mixing trough that we made, take it back up the hill, fill it back full of concrete, take it back down the hill, throw it into the mixing trough, push it back up the hill, get a bag of cement, put it in there, take it back down the hill, throw it in the mixing trough, dry mix the whole thing, wet mix the whole thing, shovel it out, it's just going to make one square, shovel it out, level it off carefully, and hope that the neighbor's peacocks don't walk in it. <laughs> now that was my task one very, very hot summer when I was about 11. Now if that had been a commission I certainly could not have done it. But Dad never commissioned me to do it. Give me instructions, leave it to me, check on me at the end of the summer. No, we did it together. We did it together. When he called me to come help, I was responsible to help, and I put my back into it. But he did the really heavy lifting. And truth be told, he probably would have gotten it done a lot faster without me. But it was never just about making concrete blocks. During that project, I lost weight. I got stronger. I learned something about construction. 
And most of all, when it was done, it was something we had done together that we would enjoy the rest of the time we lived at that house. I think the best part of yesterday's Shape and Race was seeing how it was a project that sons and dads and sons and granddads had worked on together. And I saw that and I thought back on a concrete patio. See, I think this commission business sometimes obscures what Jesus is doing. We're not building God's kingdom. We're not building God's church. Jesus said, I'm doing that. The kingdom he's building is us. We're the kingdom. The most important part of disciple making is working with Jesus to make disciples. Working with him is how he teaches us. It's how he shapes us. Making disciples with Jesus is how Jesus makes disciples of us. When we stand at the end beholding the kingdom that he's built, we're not going to be looking at castles and skyscrapers. We're going to be looking at each other. We're the kingdom. Block by block, Jesus calls us to mix concrete with him. And yes, a church is being built, an organization through the centuries. But it's not ultimately about the concrete. It's about us getting stronger, learning to be like our master. And in the end, what he will have built is not a city. It will be an eternal family. Jesus is with us always. When we get confused about who is the real disciple maker, we become branches detached from the vine. We believe the fiction that the kingdom depends on us, our gifts, our cleverness, our plans, our vision. You know, there are heroes and there are sidekicks. There are heroes and there are sidekicks, okay? When the sidekicks imagine that they're the heroes, you know what you get? Comic relief. <laughs> when we imagine that our weakness is strong enough to turn people to repentance or inspire them to faith or give them forgiveness or restore the earth to the paradise that he intended, we're comical. And I'm afraid I've given heaven quite enough humor for one lifetime. Now, of course, now, now look, if we were... If we were on our own, redemption would depend on us being heroes. But we are not on our own. Jesus is with us always. Our task, as some wise man once shared with me many years ago, my, our task is simply to show up in all of our conspicuous weakness. Because Jesus has not commissioned us to make disciples alone. Rather, he's instructed us to make disciples alongside of him. We follow his lead, and his strength is manifested. And they become his disciples. We become his disciples. And later on, we, we discover that while we've been helping Jesus disciple others, he's been discipling us the whole time. And while we've been working on projects, Jesus has been working on us alongside of our brothers and our sisters. One of the things this means, I want us to think about this. One of the things this means is that we should not equate success and disciple making with achieving our ministry goals. It's weird, I'm going to say it again. We should not equate our success and disciple making with achieving our ministry goals. Human beings need goals to focus our work. Goals help us work efficiently. The right goals do. The right goals help us to work together. The right goals help us to evaluate what's happening. Goals are the tools that focus our faithfulness. So our goals are very important and, and Christ wants us to have them. But Jesus is not committed to our goals. He is committed to discipleship. 
Our specific goals for ministry are not always the same as Jesus' goals for discipleship. Every week I labor, I work very, very hard to preach to you one big biblical idea. You know what it is because I tell you at the end, right? One idea, I work very hard to do that. And most of the time I think that God blesses you for the labor I put in to try to do that. But sometimes, and you know because this has happened to you, sometimes people are moved by a biblical detail I barely mentioned and God has used that to speak to them. And when that happens, I have technically failed. But Jesus has succeeded, right? And I'm very glad about that. Jesus is not constricted by our goals or by uh, our uh, criteria for success. And that's true whether we're talking about a sermon or a missionary weekend or, or reaching a high school or, wel or, or welcoming refugees or, or raising a family. The risen Christ has his own goals for discipleship, people that he is determined to reach because he died for them, blessings that he is determined to give how and therefore when he chooses. That's what Jesus is working to accomplish because unlike us, he understands his father's design, his mind perfectly. So we do our best to do what? We do our best to be faithful. We do our best to be faithful. And we hope for certain responses during a worship service and we long for certain milestones with our kids on a timetable that seems desirable to us. And Jesus works through our faithfulness to bring blessing to our kids and to our worship service, but not necessarily to accomplish our specific goals or our milestones or our timetable. Why? Why? Because through our faithfulness, Jesus is building his Father's kingdom, not ours. He builds his Father's kingdom through ministries that raise millions and reach thousands. And he builds his Father's kingdom through decades of sacrifice for one single child. Jesus is here. And Jesus is getting God's will done on earth as it is in heaven through our faithfulness. And the great thing is that Jesus Christ doesn't know how to fail. Now we want our ministries, our strategies to be useful. Of course, we want them to have divine power. But you see, if we are faithful in our service, then Jesus, God's purposes, will succeed whether or not our projects do. Because Jesus is with us, we don't have to worry about success. We need only focus on faithfulness. Jesus will take care of the success. That's a remarkable thing to say. Did you just make that up, Glenn? I didn't. If you want to study that, look at, look at 2 Peter 1. Study it carefully. We've done it here in, in the last 30 years a number of times. I call them Peter's principles. But Peter very, very carefully lays out for us what it means to be faithful. And then he clearly, explicitly teaches us that if we're faithful, success, as God sees it, in terms of fruitfulness, will inevitably follow, whether we can see it that way or not. And sometimes it's hard to see how Jesus is going to use our faithfulness because so little seems to be accomplished in our own eyes. Abraham never saw God's promises fulfilled in his whole life. His faith was called successful. Isaiah was successful, you know, who am I going to send? Send me. Fantastic. I guarantee you, I, almighty God, guarantee you, no one's going to listen to you. <laughs> Isaiah was successful. John the Baptist was so successful, he was decapitated. How many disciples did Jesus make before he ascended? I know there was a handful of people called that, but really 12 principal ones. One of them betrayed him. When you worship a man whose end result of ministry is to be crucified, you tell me, how are you supposed to measure success? Disciple making is always more about faithfulness to Jesus Christ than success of our ministry goals. It may shock you to hear this, but Jesus is not the instrument of our success. 
We are the instruments of his success. And he is always able to use genuine faithfulness, however stumbling it may be, to accomplish his father's will. That's why he's here. And that's how God's sovereignty works out in this crazy world. Before we end today, let me just say a few words to those here for whom disciple making demands most of your lives. And you know who you are. I am with you always. Does this I am phrase echo Jesus' divinity? I don't know. But I do know that his divinity overshadows the whole event. You love the man Jesus. You love who he is. And you love what he did for you. But your hope and your joy do not lie in any mere man, even a perfect one. Jesus is the flesh and blood, living, divine face of the Father. In his human death, you have been embraced by God's love. In his resurrection, his human resurrection, you have been grasped by God's life. Disciple maker, never stop worshiping him. You too will doubt sometimes. We cannot approach sacrifice without doubting. But when you doubt, doubt at his feet. The word worship means to get on your, on, your, on your face here. Doubt at his feet. Bring your doubt and your pain and your confusion to him. And in laying it before him, make it a part of your worship. These men who worshipped him as they doubted were the ones he chose to make disciples with. I am with you always. At the Last Supper, Jesus tried to explain that it was to our advantage that he is sent to heaven. He tried to explain that by being, that being with us through the Holy Spirit would be far better than staying with us in the flesh. Can you imagine if Jesus had, in fact, stayed with us, didn't ascend? At his rate of discipleship, what, 11 and 3 years? He could have made just over some 7,000 disciples over the last two millennia. Wow. Wow. Seekers would have to stand in one long line. Yeah, I think uh, Jesus can fit you in the fall of 2021. Uh, and every disciple would only have three years with him, and that'd be it, because after that, they'd be sent out to serve him on their own without his help, because he'd be discipling somebody else. That's not the way it is, is it? Disciple maker, Jesus is with you. And the wonderful mystery of his divinity, no matter how many serve him, he remains with you. Individually, you get to live with him. You get to walk so close to him, you watch him work. One of my very favorite pictures in all the Gospels, I love it, every time I think about it, I just love it, is Jesus preaching in Peter's boat. It was during that time when Peter was deciding whether or not to follow this man. The scene is often portrayed with Jesus in the bow, Peter keeping the boat steady at the rear. You know, as Jesus preached, Peter would be functionally invisible because all eyes would be fixed on the master as he spoke words of life, powerful words like they'd never heard before. But Peter could look over his shoulder and watch people respond to Jesus Christ just as he saw him. Watch person after person discover him Disciple maker, that's what it's like with you. If you're his sidekick, you're going to be functionally invisible. But you're going to get to look over his shoulder as person after person discovers him. I'm with you. And I'm with you always. That's a tough one to grab a hold of, isn't it? We're tempted to think that he's with us only when we can feel him, sense him with us. And there are, there's so much to distract us. And there is so much to cloud our faith. You know, this world is so violent and murky. It once took Jesus an hour to find his father again. And disciple maker, there may be times when it takes you an hour to see your master. 
because there's so much weariness and too much sorrow and too, much, too many burdens that you've picked up or have been laid upon you. Hours when picking up the cross and following just seemed like too much to ask. But you are never alone. Never. Our Lord observes everyone in this world. He watches over many. But with those who make disciples, he says, I am with you always. You've chosen to follow him. When you lose track of him, whatever the reason and however often, it's not hard for him to find you because he's never left you. And right on through the end of the age, he never will. Why would he? Your partners. Well, here it is. We make disciples in partnership with the risen Christ. It's more than a commission. It's a partnership. We make disciples in partnership with the risen Christ. We don't make disciples with Jesus' help so much as Jesus makes disciples with our help. He uses our help because that is how he disciples us. And the more we work with him, the more he works on us. And together we make disciples of all nations. Question for the week. How can I and Jesus work together? The next time you ask him to do something for you, and don't stop doing that, because we, we need to do that. But the next time you ask him to do something for you, stop and consider, what can you do together? Some way to share his truth and his love? Isn't that how Jesus discipled his disciples? By serving God together? That's how Jesus disciples you. Let's pray. Lord, I know your son is here with us, even as surely as he is there with you. I don't know how your Holy Spirit does that, manifesting him here through faith in us, among us, through us, but your Spirit does a great job. Lord, we're sorry when our faith is inadequate to realize that he's here. We lay our faith aside so easily so we can have both hands free to collect stuff and do stuff. Our lives are so full of stuff that when calamity befalls us, faith is buried somewhere in a pile and we can't put our hands on it right away. That's true for opportunities too. But we know, we know in our minds that you are with us always. We know it because you said so. Forgive us, Lord, for trying to make disciples as if we were on our own. We confess that when we do that, we always end up making disciples of ourselves, not of you. And no wonder then we worry over results and we're anxious over your provision. It's so absurd to think that you wouldn't provide for your own work. You don't. You do provide for it. And it's absurd to think that we can do what only you can do. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for wanting us to be more than comic relief. Your son actually said that together we would do even greater things than are recorded in the Bible. So, Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit. O Son of God who promised to be with us always, that we might become disciples as we make disciples with you. Amen.